Did you know that during the Second World War, some Ukrainians served in the Waffen-SS? And did you know that in smaller Ukrainian circles today, these men are being celebrated? Why is that? We've talked about Ukrainian collaboration during the Second World War before. Now we're going to zoom in on a specific unit. I'm talking about the Ukrainian Waffen-SS division, Galizia. Keep watching. Good to have you back on the channel. If you're new, I'm Stefan. I'm a Dutch history teacher. I like to create history videos for you. And if you find it interesting, consider subscribing. Also hit that notification bell. The region where these Ukrainian volunteers of the SS Galicia division came from, Eastern Galicia, had a troublesome history in the 20th century. Till the First World War, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When the First World War broke out, the Russians invaded and occupied the region after a successful offensive. However, mid-1915, after the German-Austrian Garlis Tarnuf offensive, the Russian Imperial forces were driven out. Eventually, the Russian Empire would collapse after the Russian revolutions of 1917. Then, after the First World War was over, the region was claimed by both Poland and Ukrainian nationalists. It was fought over during the Polish-Ukrainian War of 1919 and the Poles proclaimed victory and thus the region was incorporated into the Second Polish Republic. In August 1939, Germany and the USSR signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a non-aggression pact where spheres of influence were decided. Eastern Poland, as well as other regions, were for Stalin to take. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland and this started the Second World War. Did you know that the Germans actually made it to Eastern Galicia and laid siege to its capital, Lviv, now known as Lviv. The Germans undertook several attacks on the city, which were repulsed by the Polish defenders. The German attackers were led by Ferdinand Schöne, who demanded surrender. An attack would be undertaken on the 21st of September. However, by that time, the Soviets had made their way in the country. On the 17th, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Their excuse was that they wanted to protect non-Polish people. Well, this was obviously nonsense, but it is true that Eastern Poland during the interwar years was populated by not only Poles, but also by many Ukrainians looking at Eastern Galicia. Since the bulk of the Polish army was fighting against the German onslaught, the Soviets advanced quick. Hitler ordered the Germans to withdraw from the city and leave it for the Soviets to take. Soon after, Polish forces decided to surrender because they saw the situation was hopeless. Meanwhile, many Ukrainian conscripts had deserted from the Polish army. As the Soviets seized control over eastern Poland, annexations soon followed. And eastern Galicia became part of the Ukrainian SSR, which was part of the Soviet Union. Prisons were emptied and political prisoners, usually communists, were put in charge of local government. Soviet agitators urged peasants to take revenge on landlords. Though most people resisted the call to criminality, chaos reigned as thousands did not. Mass murders with axes were suddenly frequent. However, for the Ukrainians, there was no room for Ukrainian nationalism, as countless of Ukrainian nationalists were arrested, tortured and deported or executed by Soviet authorities. But not only Ukrainians, also many Poles fell victim to Stalin's terror. Notorious was the Katyn massacre, where in the spring of 1940, over 22,000 members of the Polish military and intelligentsia were mass murdered by the NKVD on Stalin's orders. Other Ukrainian nationalists came to live in the general government that was part of German occupied Poland. Here Ukrainian collaboration with the Germans really kicked off by members of the ultra-nationalist OUN, the Organization for Ukrainian Nationalists. A split in this organization occurred and from that moment there was the more moderate wing, the OUNM, led by Andrei Melnik, and a radical wing, 
the OUNB led by Stepan Bandera. In German-occupied Poland, both OUN factions collaborated with the Germans and two pro-German units were set up, the Roland Battalion and the Nactical Battalion. These battalions took part in the German invasion of the USSR that started on the 22nd of June 1941. OUNB leader Stepan Bandera made his way to Lviv and there he proclaimed an independent Ukraine. However, the Germans weren't having it and they arrested Bandera who spent most of the war incarcerated. Many OUN members were hunted down by the Germans and executed. From that moment the Germans and the OUN were in conflict with one another. In August 1941 both the Nachtigall and the Roland Battalion were withdrawn and reorganized into the Schutzmannschaft Battalion 201. Other Ukrainians served in police battalions where they had to perform police tasks and guard duties. Some units had to take part in rooting out partisans. Some of the pro-Ukrainian army units took part in hunting down Jews. While the bulk of Ukraine was placed under Erich Koch as Reichskommissariat Ukraine, the region of Eastern Galicia was incorporated in the general government, German-occupied Poland. So Germans having Ukrainians serving for them is one thing. But why did the Germans set up a Ukrainian Waffen-SS unit? Weren't the Ukrainians seen as Slavic inferior people by them? The division's official title was the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, Halicina No. 1, and it later became the first Ukrainian division of the Ukrainian National Army. It was formed as the Germans blatantly tried to solicit the help of Soviet nationalities after the failure at the Battle of Stalingrad. The title Halicina Galicia was used either because the Germans wished to avoid direct use of the more inflammatory Ukrainian or to ensure tighter German control. Pragmatism trumped ideology. After the Stalingrad disaster, the Germans took a more pragmatic approach and now Soviet nationalities were recruited on a large scale. Now it already happened before as heavy security units and like I mentioned the Roland and Nachtigall Battalion, but now the Germans stepped this up. Formed in 1943 through negotiations between the Germans and the Ukrainian Central Committee in Krakow, a Ukrainian Waffen-SS unit was set up. Governor of Galicia Otto von Werchter worked together with the Ukrainian Central Committee, which was a non-political auxiliary organization and quasi-representative body of Ukrainians founded in 1940, and its chairman Volodymyr Kubiovich. Kubiovich has several demands. The most important were freedom of religious practice. Ukrainian chaplains would be admitted into the division to provide religious services. The division would be utilized strictly on the Eastern Front against communist forces. The division would not be utilized for any of Germany's internal security needs, for example, guarding factories, war plants, POW camps, concentration camps, etc. Ukrainian officers would be appointed to division command posts. The soldiers and their families would be awarded benefits similar to those received by German soldiers serving in the Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS and at least a portion of the Ukrainians held in prisons and concentration camps would be released. As acknowledged by Kubiovich in the aftermath of World War II, the Ukrainian demands were largely met. The idea was that Galician Ukrainians who were previously loyal to the Habsburg Emperor and were of Greek Catholic fate could serve in this unit not those living in central and eastern Ukraine who are mostly of orthodox faith, although some Ukrainians from outside Galicia also joined this division. Reason to join was that many saw the Germans as a lesser evil. They had endured almost two years of harsh Soviet rule. They believed that if they joined the Germans they might secure Ukraine's independence. Now there's a great deal of naivety here since the Germans made clear from the get-go they would not recognize an independent Ukraine. Not to mention the atrocities the Germans carried out. Many joined under duress because they faced slave labor in Germany if they did not join. Many thousands volunteered and at the end the unit had around 18,000 men serving in its ranks with three regiments of infantry, one of artillery and one of training services. 
These men wore German Waffen-SS uniforms and had German weaponry. They had a distinctive Galician line on their right collar patch. Now the official name of the unit changed actually several times. I have an overview for you right here. You can pause the screen if you want to study the details. Training took place in either occupied Poland or Germany. Political lectures were held by the company commander once a week. They lasted for two hours and were mostly about the situation on the front and how Hitler was gonna solve it all. In the summer of 1944, the Ukrainian Waffen-SS unit was sent to the Eastern Front and attached to the 13th German Army Corps. Near Brody, the unit was encircled by Soviet troops. The division was initially wiped out in the area of Brody, suffering 60% casualties against the vastly superior Soviet forces. The Galicia division had deployed 11,000 men at Brody, of whom 2,807 survivors were registered after the battle. Those captured by the Soviets were either shot outright or sent to a concentration camp near Moscow. Others managed to join the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, and continue the struggle from there. In August 1944, Himmler decided to create a new Galicia division out of the remnants of the destroyed one with additional recruits. In autumn of 1944, they went to Slovakia to assist the Germans in crushing the Slovak national uprising. In January, they were sent to Austria and Slovenia. As part of the Ukrainian National Army, the UNA, they fought last-ditch battles before the armistice on the 8th of May 1945 came to effect as a surrender to the Western Allies. Now back to the 16th of May 1944, Himmler spoke to the unit, said the following. Your homelet has become so much more beautiful since you have lost, on our initiative, I must say, the residents who were so often a dirty blemish on Galicia's good name, namely the Jews. Now, some historians argue that Himmler implied that these Ukrainian Waffen SS men wiped out the Jews from the region, but he clearly states our initiative, so he basically takes responsibility for it. Yet, the Ukrainian Waffen SS division did take part in atrocities against Polish civilians. Several massacres were carried out at Polish villages, such as Huta Pinyachka, Pitkamin and Palikrovi. The killing of Polish civilians on a large scale occurred in Volhynia in eastern Galicia, where 50 to 100,000 Poles were slaughtered, some in very brutal ways, by the Ukrainians. But according to historian Timothy Schneider, most of these Poles were not killed by members of the Galicia division, but by members of the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. I do want to point out Ukrainians served in another Waffen-SS unit, the 30th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, which consisted of Russians, Belarusians and Ukrainians. This unit mutinied in occupied France and elements of it joined the French resistance. After the war, many of them settled in the US and in Canada, as most of them were not forcibly repatriated to the USSR since it only applied on those living in the USSR before the 1st of September 1939. In Canada, monuments dedicated to these men have been erected, leading to controversy. Also in Ukraine, there are such memorials. In the years after the fall of the USSR and the independence of Ukraine, members of the pro-German Ukrainian units from World War II are being celebrated by Ukrainian nationalists. On images like these, you can see what I mean. Now, in some cases, they are being celebrated by neo-Nazis, but not all Ukrainians who celebrate these men are neo-Nazis because they view this unit differently than Western historians do. Many books have been written by veterans of the Waffen-SS Galicien, some of whom became professors at Western universities. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the apologetic and selective narrative initiated by these historians and other writers was taken over mostly by young historian, patriotic historians and activists based in Western Ukraine. Many of these historians claim that the Ukrainian Waffen-SS soldiers fought for what they perceive as the lesser of two evils. Now, 
A great deal of them joined the UPA, but the UPA was against both the Soviets and the Nazis. But as one Ukrainian historian stated, you cannot fight everyone. So that's why it was better to stay on the German side. And in some cases, it is claimed these volunteers did save Ukrainian peasants from German reprisals. According to Ukrainian historians, their prime motivation was an independent Ukraine and that's where they fought for. Now, in English, there's this beautiful saying stuck between a rock and a hard place and that definitely is the case here. But on the flip side, erecting monuments for these men, celebrating them as heroes, it's a little bit too far, if you ask me. And don't get me wrong, there's also many Ukrainians who agree with this. Because in 1993 in Kyiv, there was a campaign to ban the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Waffen-SS unit. So it's certainly not the case that all Ukrainians hail these Ukrainian Waffen-SS men. And perhaps with the recent developments in Ukraine, some real heroes can stand up that will be celebrated in the future. Only time will tell. Thanks to my patrons, you see their names on the screen right now and a special thanks to Thomas Zabiega, Liam Devlin, Damien Wallace, Connor, Philip Jordan, Jakob Muslim, Nick Terranova, Haley, Mark Little Hill, Janusz Dojankiewicz, Joan, Justin Tabell, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Susanna Di Bella, John Beach, Wayback History, Luis Pichera, Fernando Lopez Ojeda and Mike West. If you'd like to learn more about Ukrainian history, click right here. If you'd like to support me, the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I see you later.